information as well as for the embarrassingly kind words of praise. And I'm very glad that I would, I, I would report on Palabagos this evening to the Arwarians. Now an introduction with a, a detailed analysis of the history of archaeological research in Palabagos would have made it easier for Arwa's international audience to identify the crucial research questions that led to the initiation of the Palepafos Urban Landscape Project, PALP for short. But since I must not keep you on Zoom for longer than 45 minutes, I will follow an alternative vein. After an abridged version of previous research, I will employ the results and preliminary interpretations of our own ongoing projects to explain how our original quest for the spatial definition and protection of the almost invisible urban landscape of ancient Paphos took us literally from the coast to the southwestern slopes of the Trudos Mountains and back. The first documented excavation project in Palepafos was conducted in 1887. It was a rather aggressive attempt on behalf of the first British archaeological campaign in Cyprus to investigate the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Thanks to a rich corpus of literary testimonia, the fame of the sacred cult center, whose monolithic blocks were and still are visible well above ground, had survived since antiquity. As we will see shortly, this exclusively literary fame buried the original identity of the sanctuary and distorted the history of its founder, the polity of Paphos. It is therefore not surprising that the temple's material remains did not stand up to the expectations of the notoriously colonial Cyprus Ex Exploration Fund. For the next 60 years, Palepafos and the wretched village of Kuklia, as it was unashamedly described, were abandoned. Fortunately, the British archaeologists true to their classical training, published inscriptions from the sanctuary, which constitute an outstanding documentation of the second life of the sacred site. When Cyprus was under the Ptolemies and the Romans, hence as of the third century BC, the temple of Aphrodite was chosen by the new rulers because of its antiquity, as Tacitus tells us, to become the island's first pan-Cypriot cult center. In the 1950s, attracted by the discovery of Cyprosyllabic inscriptions, celebrated epigraphist Terence P. Mitford and J.H. Alif, curator of the Liverpool Museum, devoted three years of excavations in Kuklia. They departed in haste when the armed conflict against British rule broke out in 1955. Although they did have time to arrange for the transportation of some exceptional sculpture to the Liverpool Museum, they left behind masses of unpublished material and three semi-excavated built monuments at Marcello, Evredi and Hajapula, which were inherited by Franz Georg Mayer and the Swiss German expedition. Professor Mayer was the only one who had come to stay. From 1966 and for the next 50 years or so, practically until his passing away, history and archaeology of Palepafos where his sole project, his impressive publication record, is almost exclusively devoted to Paphos. In the meantime, hundreds of rescue operations had to be carried out by the Department of Antiquities. The most well-known is that of the Scales Early Ionis Necropolis, published by Vasos Karayorgis in 1983, and the Eliomilia Terratsudia Late Cypriot Chamber Tombs, also published by VK in 1990. Otherwise, tidbits of laconic information about tombs dating from the late Cypriot to late antiquity were scattered in dozens of annual reports where the recovery of artifacts from endless looting operations was also frequently reported. How were all these different archaeo data from the vast and unprotected landscape of the municipal boundaries of the modern community of Kuklia mapped and registered? 
This is the best map that existed up to 2002, when a group of colleagues from the Archaeological Research Unit and the Laboratory of Geophysical, Satellite, Remote Sensing and Archaeo Environment of the Mediterranean Institute in Brethymno arrived at Palepafos, determined to develop a heritage management tool, the Palepafos Digital Archaeological Atlas. It was a two-year project and it had two main components, the development of a GIS linked to an entity-related geodatabase and a multi-sensor geophysical survey. In 2002, a daunting amount of archaeocultural information from published and unpublished records began to be collected and placed under this one digital umbrella. The custom-made GIS platform, which has become the master document of our activities over the last 20 years, continues to be annually augmented thanks to the expert and devoted attention of Dr. Athos Agabil, now assistant professor at the Technical University of Cyprus. The results of the 2002 landscape analysis were transferred onto orthophotomaps per chronocultural horizon. Thanks to the Department of Lands and Surveys of the Republic of Cyprus, whose collaboration and assistance we continue to enjoy, the data could also be uploaded on the digital land relief of Kupia Pelebefus, where they are associated with property and land use status. In 2003, we proceeded with an extensive geophysical survey of the landscape under the direction of Apostolos Eris. We hope that it would be possible to define the limits between an intra and an extra Muros landscape of the ancient settlement of Paphos so that we could propose measures for its protection from modern development projects. Systematically analyzed in 2004, the data from these two interconnected projects produced some rather unexpected results and forced us to question not only the size estimates of the ancient site that varied from 65 to 144 hectares, but also traditional notions regarding its structure. There was little to support Mitford's belief in the existence of a city wall. Although we had initiated the project on the basis of this conviction, as I have often admitted in print and in lecturing, we ended up opening Pandora's box. It appeared that urban developments were instead associated with four distinct terraces. We therefore needed a new project and a new methodological approach to unlock the development of the urban structure from the time of the foundation of Paphos and through the major transformations that it had undergone to the end of antiquity and beyond. In 2005, when applications for funding and for the excavation permits were submitted, the main research questions oh. behind the initiation of PALP had also been defined. And I think that having identified from early on the significance of the three names borne by the site, Bafos, Palebafos, Kupia, did play a decisive role in our decision to approach and document the landscape with different tools, including surveys in the hinterland and targeted excavations on the urban plateaus. Let me try to, to explain this. Unlike any other geographical locus in Cyprus, the original site location that has borne the name Paphos was twice renamed. It was defined as Palepaphos from the third century BC so that it could be distinguished from Neapaphos and later Kovok, Kuklia, in the medieval period. Today, we understand how dramatically different the social and economic landscape of each of these three life cycles was. Kuklia, the medieval Kovok, was a feudal estate of the crusader family of the Lusignans that had purchased Cyprus from Richard the Lionheart. It specialized in the plantation economy of sugarcane and the export of sugar to Europe. The excessive use of water resources for the cultivation of the cane and the operation of the mills and the contents of timber needed to operate the kilns of the sugar factory 
which has been exemplarily excavated and published by Marie-Louise von Warburg, left behind a totally transformed and impoverished landscape. But it also damaged the great temenus. The impressive megaliths were removed and carved to serve the industrial production of sugar. They became millstones. The sanctuary and the medieval manor house of the Lusignans, one dating to 1200 BC, the other to 1200 AD, lie next to each other within the official archeological site of Palebapos. The rest of the protected area is covered with stores and buildings with mosaic floors of the late Roman period, when the otherwise small town of Palebapos, not Paphos, did become a site of international pilgrimage, even for Roman emperors. What is therefore the key difference between Paphos and Palepaphos, which was blared until recently? Paphos was a polity, a polis with a horror, a territorial state with an internationally successful political economy, evidence of which goes as far back as the 13th century BC. Inscriptions, coin issues, and historiographical sources speak of one of the strongest and more stable city-states of Cyprus, and one that, unlike Encomi, for example, did not shift from its position, nor suffered abandonment or destruction towards the end of the late Bronze Age, like other late Cypriot urban polities have. Its eponymous Greek named leaders are recorded on local inscriptions since the late 8th century BC. They were even recognized by the Assyrian ruler Esarhaddon early in the 7th century BC. In Professor Meyer's apt description, Palepaphos was no more than a sanctuary town. It lived off revenues for, for pilgrimages, like religious tourism. It did not manage a state economy, nor was in control of an economic territory. Its existence was hardly relevant to the settlement structure of the Paphos hinterland, which since the foundation of Nea Paphos in the fourth century BC, would have redirected its communication routes towards the region's new harbor. In the Palepaphos cycle from the third century BC, when the city-states of the island were abolished by Ptolemy Soter, to the end of the fourth century AD, when pilgrim visitations and state-endorsed festivals were gradually abandoned under the growing impact of Christianity, the abbot of the Cypriot goddess served the colonial politics of the Ptolemaic kingdom and the Roman empire respectively. The new political role which the sanctuary was made to perform in the Hellenistic and Roman periods suppressed its own original identity and its primary relation with its founding polity of Paphos. Despite the fact that it represents the sanctuary with the longest unbroken cult tradition in Cyprus from the late Bronze Age to the late Roman period, it is still often interpreted as if it had always been a pan-Cypriot sanctuary. Yet, it had functioned for a much longer period as the autochthonous cult center of the kings of Paphos and priests of the Wanasa, the goddess, who was never addressed as Aphrodite by the kings of Paphos. So the recovery of the sanctuary's millennium long primary role depends on the recovery of the almost invisible landscape of its founding polity, namely Paphos and the Paphian region's associated settlement structure, which, strictly speaking, is still unknown. With the use of geospatial analysis and advanced documentation and imaging technologies, we are building a diachronic model of the urban structure of the ancient polity and a site distribution model of the Paphos hydrological basin. Cyprus's conventional, though still arbitrary model of survey units is based on the main and the subsidiary hydrological basins, what Eddie Peltenburg described as conventional regional zones based on the island's geology. 
Once the maximum extent of PALP's research and survey area had been designated as the catchment of Bathos with its four main rivers, we initiated the macro scale analysis of the Paphian region. This approach allows us to reconnect the polis of Bathos with its little known periphery, the history of an ancient settlement like Bathos that had functioned as a region's central place does not constitute the history of a polity. The history of a polity is primarily the record of transformations borne by its regional site hierarchy system over time. We should therefore approach a Cypriot polity not only from its primary urban center, but also from its associated settlement structure. Some of you may remember that back in January, I had the honor of presenting a lecture in Professor Maran's digital research, research colloquium in Heidelberg. It was titled Central Places and Their Peripheries. And it ended with a promise to concentrate on Bafos and its periphery. This evening, my attempt is to fulfill that promise with what little we have been able to achieve to this day regarding landscape transformation and settlement patterning in the region of Bathos. I admit, however, that the region remains intimidating. It is just a little less of the terra incognita that David Rabb and his project team had so courageously tried to survey some decades ago. Despite our steadfastly diachronic interest, we will concentrate on the Paphos cycle because it is the first time that an ongoing landscape project produces considerable data regarding the foundation of Paphos and attempts to reconnect it on the one hand with its long forgotten coastal identity and on the other with its periphery. Because of the distance of the sanctuary from the current coastline, Paphos was not considered a coastal site until quite recently. It is in his influential, though still unpublished doctoral dissertation, a genuine island-wide compendium, that Yorgos Yoriu collected the evidence, primarily from surveys and rescue operations, which pointed to the foundation of Paphos as a terminal link in a chain of hinterland settlements from the foothills of the Trudos to the coast along the river Diarists. This first comprehensive study of site distribution in the catchment of Paphos from the third millennium BC to the end of the Middle Cypriot was then taken up by Athos Agabi, who carried it to the end of the late Bronze Age with the use of geographical information systems. Moreover, in 2010, his thesis has now been updated into a joint chapter with Artemis Yeru and will be published in Pulp's first volume on Foundation Horizon of Paphos. The presence of a thin scatter of late Cypriot III, late Cypriot IA shirts from different loci of the site of Paphos was known and considered as the earliest evidence pointing to the establishment of human groups. Today, we employ them as geospatial evidence that can further elucidate the foundation horizon of the Paphos gateway. The analysis relies on the unparalleled ceramic competence of Artemis Yeru, who has recently identified more Middle Cypriot III shirts from the Palps excavations and confirms that Paphos was founded at the same time as almost all the late Cypriot gateways that were to become urban polities and international ports of call in the late Bronze Age. It also points out to the fact that the great sanctuary was established half a millennium after the foundation of the gateway community. Paphos was therefore established in the name of a port of call around 1700 BC, not in the name of a late Cypriot 2C or 3A sanctuary. There was, however, there are, however, two more important observations worth focusing upon now that we are treating Paphos as a coastal establishment. 
some of the middle Cypriot three, late Cypriot one material comes from chamber tombs that were evidently inaugurated during the foundation horizon, but they also continue to be used by their respective family groups to the end of the late Cypriot period. These tombs are within the settlement. They accompany the Lossae where different groups chose to establish their homes when they moved near the coast. Thus, the medium scale landscape analysis, which documents transformations within the settlement of Paphos, allows us to approach the establishment pattern of the founders and to follow them to the end of late Cypriot 3A, when the tombs were all abandoned. Paphos was neither abandoned nor suffered destruction at any time during the 13th or the 12th centuries BC, but to this critical issue of the abandonment of the late Cypriot tombs, we will return later. The settlers had come from different settlements to service the needs of a trading harbor. Their heterogeneous provenance is strongly expressed in the dispersed pattern of their establishment on all of the main plateaus, which some centuries later will constitute the urban landscape of the polity. It is Palp's excavations of the easternmost plateau of Hagi Abdullah that has provided the ceramic evidence with which the fourth plateau has been included in the foundation horizon. Priscilla Keswani, in her classic work on the comparable phenomenon of clustering in relation to the foundation of the gateway of Enkomi, suggests that members of different regional communities converged to exploit the opportunities for trade and other economic activities. In the absence of an initial sense of communal identity, the settlers may have dug or built their tombs near their houses to symbolize through the immediate presence of their ancestors, their local identity and their rights to local residents and resources. Although a proper project on the Paleo Coast is only just beginning this year with Dr. Miltiadis Polidoru, our concern regarding the location of its original anchorage, which like all late Cypriot harbors has, has disappeared on dry land, mainly due to coastal uplift and river silting, has been considered from different angles. It even preoccupied our geological officer, Zeza Zomeni, in her doctoral dissertation. Based on the distribution of the late Cypriot clusters, which form an arc around the narrow valley of Lures, I have suggested that the invisible original anchorage must probably a natural protected lagoon may be situated in this part of the now alluvial coastal plain. I also think that the location chosen for the establishment of the sanctuary on the plateau of Alonia that rises steeply on the west bank of Lures points to the nearby location of a contemporary late Cypriot anchorage. It is likely that just like its only sibling, the contemporary Temenos of Kition, the Paphos sanctuary was meant to have proximity and visibility with the port, and maybe to act as its manager, as a port authority. The megalithic Temenos is the first and only communal monument constructed by the founders of Paphos, but of course it took them half a millennium after their establishment to do it. In 1200 BC, when they could invest in this unparalleled and unprecedented sacred monument, Paphos was no longer a gateway, but the region's central place and the first and only urban center of southwestern Cyprus to the end of the Cypro-Classical period. The foundation of Nea Paphos by one of the last kings, almost certainly Nicocles, in the fourth century BC, signals the establishment of a new harbor. Before long, this new harbor received the navy of, of Ptolemy. From then on, Neapaphos was developed as the region's new urban and administrative center. 
literary references suggest that during the Halebafo cycle, the sanctuary was not approached from the sea, but from terrestrial roads. So we can well see that Bafos had begun to lose its coastal identity already in late antiquity. But besides losing its direct control of the harbor, the old capital also lost the better part of its urban structure. The medium scale analysis of the urban landscape shows that the three plateaus beyond that of the sanctuary were abandoned in a rather short period of time after Paphos had lost its status as a city-state capital. Even Professor Meyer had noted the absence of pottery of Roman date on the plateaus beyond the sanctuary. Palepaphos therefore had shrunk around it. This drastic transformation is excellent news to us archaeologists. It meant that built monuments of the period of the autonomous city-state of Paphos could still be unearthed. Since no built monuments of the late Hellenistic or Roman era have been reported from Marcello, Mandisa, or Hagia Abdullah, gymnasia, baths, theaters, the formula of the Hellenistic city, all were built in near Paphos, none in Palapa. On Martello survives one of the rare Sibrarchaic ramparts of Cyprus. Although it was originally excavated by Midford and later finalized and published by Professor Meyer, it is still only a section of a secular and maybe also sacred monument. I am happy to say that following Pulp's three year long Martello project, which revealed its Western extension, we have invited the University of Athens to undertake the investigation of the unexcavated plots around it. The director, my colleague, Professor Costandinos Kopanyas, will be giving the first report on his first two extremely productive campaigns in the forthcoming Gnostic Conference in Athens on 12th November. Although this evening I will not present the new Cypro classical monuments we located on Haji Abdullah and Laona, in any detail, I must admit that we were taken by surprise by their excellent state of preservation, especially by the workshop complex on Hajj Abdullah and by the wealth of our environmental data pointing to the investments of the royal dynasty, which evidently included the production of purple dye. We are now quite certain that the plateau had functioned as the citadel of the state of Paphos during the fifth and fourth centuries BC. And this ostragon inscribed in the syllabary with quantities of unidentified products entering or exiting the workshop area has further strengthened our interpretation. It was the micro scale analysis of the material from the workshop complex of Hajj Abdullah that sent us to the mountains in search of the polity's primary resources. Purple shells were collected from the coast, but copper slag and charcoal from pine trees had to come from the highlands. And as a matter of fact, timber and cupriferous sources lie next to each other on the foothills of the Paphos forest, 25 kilometers to the north. So we took to the mountains under the guidance of geologist Dr. Zomeni, Agabiu geolocated and quantified the slag heaps, which back in 1998 were first reported by the Gales and Mayotis, and my colleague Vasiliki Kasianidou selected slag samples. Almost all the slag heaps date from late antiquity, which is not surprising, but the procurement of copper from the catchment of Paphos is amply confirmed. Kasianidou and her research team is now working on the slag from the mountains and the urban landscape to develop Paphos' mining environment study. The first results offer hope that this comparative archaeometallurgical project will define the fingerprint of the Paphos copper deposits. It is too early to say to what extent copper from its own catchment contributed to the rise of complexity in Paphos. 
but we can confirm that out there, as late as late antiquity, was an industrial landscape which, following the complete abandonment of Cyprus's copper economy, was taken over and hidden well by the rich Trudos forest. Now the forest and the lower terraces and foothills of the mountains on either side of the riverbanks continued to hide the settlement pattern of the Paphian territory. This brings me to one of the most difficult research questions of our project. We are puzzled by the fact that Paphos was founded in middle Cypriot three to late Cypriot one, but unlike other contemporary gateways, it does not seem to have asserted its authority until much later. We cannot ascribe the problem to lack of visibility because the evidence is missing from the urban center of Paphos, not only from the periphery. Unlike Enkomi and also Halasutan Deke, for example, that soon after their establishment had assumed the role of their region's respective central places, Paphos cannot lay claim to such developments until late in late Cypriot III in the 13th century. No wonder that in a recent joint article, Lindy Crew and Artemis Yuriu suggest that the few imports amidst the unimpressive late Cypriot material of Paphos was not the result of direct trade, but may have come from the sites in the Morphu Bay, the Yairin, for example. So, when did the region of Paphos first come under a central authority which maintained communication and exchange routes from the high altitude of the Paphos forest, where the rich timber and metal resources are concentrated, and all the way south to the coast and beyond? A few years ago, in 2018, I felt the urge to provide a preliminary interpretation regarding this delayed state formation episode, based, however, on the still imperfect site distribution of the catchment. <clears throat> Contrary to the evidence from the north coast of Cyprus, which confirms incipient stages in the emergence of sociopolitical complexity in relation to ports of coal since the early Bronze Age, the configuration of the human territory of Paphos in the later third millennium BC shows no signs of contact with the South Coast for the purpose of seaward exchanges. In fact, the early Cypriot period in the region remains a mystery, partly because early and middle Cypriot tombs from rescue operation, especially in the area of Kisonerga to the west, remain unpublished. As we have already seen, the crucial horizon for the development of the catchment of Paphos from an uncentral landscape to the economic territory of the first polity of Southwest Cyprus was initiated in middle Cypriot three, late Cypriot one. Analysis of the available evidence from the hydrological basin of Paphos shows that the number of sites recorded in the catchment in middle Cypriot three to late Cypriot one A is nearly doubled by comparison to the earlier phase. 45 versus 25, and includes the first evidence of activity at the site where the urban center of Bacchus was to grow. However, it also points to the colonization of another coastal location, which is to this day known as Yeroskip, the sacred gardens of Aphrodite. It is therefore likely that the sites of Bacchus and Yeroskipu had been founded as the terminal links of two different site clusters. Both originate near the copper and timber resources of the southwestern foothills of the Trudos, but they mark two different routes to the south coast. The eastern route is along the river valley of the Arisos, the western route along the river valley of Ezusa. Although a survey and exploration of the landscape of Yeroskibu is severely hindered by modern development projects, the earliest ceramic, the ceramic evidence from the neighboring cluster of sites confirms significant activity in middle Cypriot three, late Cypriot one. Also in late Cypriot one B and two A, 
when according to Crew and Yergi, the focus of occupation was transferred to the coast. They also point to the sharp drop observed in the number of late Cypriot 1B sites in the hinterland and the abandonment of Kisone Gascaya as evidence of nucleation processes related to the establishments on the coast. The delta of the Ezusa next to Yeroskipu could have functioned as an alternative gateway to Paphos. To the extent that the evidence supports the establishment of two gateways on the south coast, this could mean that little known island sites were involved in the exploitation of primary resources with and form two competing centers of activity. They served two transport systems that operated from north to south in two distinct river valleys in relation to two different gateways that had been founded ex nihilo on the coast around 1700 BC. So, how long did it take for the region to be unified under a single authority that controlled the exploitation of the territory's resources? The construction of the labor demanding megalithic terminus of Paphos around 1200 BC on a plateau from where it could possibly oversee its harbor leaves little doubt that in the 13th century, the region was no longer a divided economic landscape. But it also shows that Paphos had not established its authority over the region until almost the period of the Mediterranean wide crisis. I wonder, therefore, whether Paphos did not simply survive the crisis of the late 13th century, but rather profited from it to ascertain its authority as the political center of an extensive economic territory. Please correct me if uh, you think I'm wrong, but it does not seem that Paphos was present during the age of internationalism. It has a very low visibility during that period. On the contrary, it is clear that it joined the Mediterranean exchange network during the age of transformations. And it was right in the midst of the crisis that Paphos confirmed and publicized its authority with an unprecedented sacred monument. Renowned since the days of Homer, the emblematic sanctuary served as the exclusive ritual topos of the polity in the new socioeconomic environment of the Union. Before I bid you good night, I kindly ask you to stay with me on the return trip from the wilderness of the Paphian hinterland to the urban nucleus of Paphos at the time when the Temenos was under construction. All kinds of transformations are taking place all over Cyprus during the transition from late Cypriot 2C to late Cypriot 3A, and again from the 12th to late 11th century BC. But in Paphos, we can study them all in the social landscape of the same site, since it did not shift nor suffer destruction of any kind. The most dramatic transformation affecting the urban environment of Paphos at this time is the closure of the late Cypriot family tombs. All late Cypriot tomb clusters were abandoned and never reused. There is no evidence of an early Iron, early, an early iron Age burial in the chamber tombs that held late Cypriot 3A interments. To the extent that these were the family tombs of the founders since late Cypriot one, it is likely that the transformed social and economic environment did not work in favor of the old local families. <clears throat> late Cypriot 3A is the last phase of intra-settlement burials all over Cyprus, but it is also the phase in which <clears throat> we observe the appearance, <clears throat> excuse me, of a new and short-lived type of tomb that did not last for long after the 12th century BC. The shaft grave, a simple shaft destined for a single or double interment, 
though not for destitute individuals. <coughs> a few have been recorded in Kitium, as well as in Enkon and Halan Sultan the Cape. But now that Richard Catling has published his father's, Hector Catling's, long awaited tombs from the 1950s excavations, it appears that Paphos has the lead with a very high number. 21 sharp graves were excavated at Caminha, side by side with late Cypriot chamber tombs. Who are these individuals? Keshwani has attributed the proliferation of sharp graves in late Cypriot 3A to the presence of foreigners, functionaries, or specialists, in general people detached from their place of origin. The resident craftsmen and stonemasons whose specialized skills are not recorded in the region of Paphos before late Cypriot 2C to 3A, would not have owned an ancestral tomb. The exquisite carvings of ivory, the turning of raw metal into intricately crafted jewelry in Cloisonne, the hammering of iron for the production of some of the earliest iron tools and weapons of Cyprus, the drafting of and building of huge blocks of stone, document the rapid development of all these crafts in Bathos during a very short period of time. Whether they have come from abroad or from other Cypriot polities, and Enkomi would be a, a perfect candidate, they represent newcomers, probably economic migrants, as Colstrom would have called them, for, for, for whose interment it would have been fitting to use a shaft grave. What next? If shaft graves were a symptom of the 12th century BC and of changes in the settled social fabric of the island, they disappeared all the same from the early Iron Age urban environment together with the late Cypriot chamber tombs. Intra-settlement burials were not established again anywhere in Cyprus during the Iron Age. Alps landscape analysis of the newly established early Iron Age community burial grounds shows that beyond the four plateaus where the settlement had grown since its late Cypriot foundation. As of the 11th century BC, they are recorded at Skales, Lacos to Skarnu, Hasanagas, Xerolim, Xilinos, and Blakes. In these rapidly expanding chamber tomb cemeteries, we witness the introduction of the new wheel-made, fine ware painted pottery. The skills and imagination of the potters of Bathos in the production of a wide range of shapes in proto-white painted and white painted one ware has not yet been matched by any of the other regional production centers. From the cemetery of Plakes on the west side of the Arizos, to that of Scales, more than two kilometers to the southeast of the sanctuary, rescue excavations by the Department of Antiquities have recovered monumental bronze amphoroid craters, shield bosses, helmets with or without cheek pieces, mace heads, obeloi, iron swords, and bimetallic knives, as well as gold jewelry and gold plaques embossed with the head of the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Besides registering an exceptional high degree of specialization that was not lost in the course of the transformations, the local manufacture of these luxury items confirms that Paphos continued to have access to copper sources and that it could exchange its resources for tin and gold. The content of many of these tombs also reveals the development of a new class of merchant aristocrats that were buried with their weapons and their symposium gear. Of all the precious finds in the supergeometric tombs, the most elegant with regard to the successful handling of the crisis are two inscribed metal objects, which confirm the long-term continuity of late Cypriot scribal technology. The Cyprominoan script was not lost like other systems like Linear B, for example. The inscribed bronze obelus from Scales, tomb 49, and the more recent inscribed bronze bowl from Scales, tomb 235, studied by Marcus Eketmeyer, 
indicate that the late Cypriot script of the island had been adopted by a new population that made it a scribal tool of a new language. The new language, identified as the archaeo cypriot greek dialect, is the one in which the first kings of Paphos, Agestor, and the Deandros recorded their title as basilis, as kings, on precious metal objects of the early 7th century. In closing, the evidence from the site of ancient Paphos confirms that the city of Paphos functioned as a place of economic and ideological centrality in the context of an autonomous Cypriot polity from around the 13th century BC to the end of the 4th century BC. However, how the settlement structure of the horror of Paphos responded or, or was reorganized in the course of the transformative horizon, also during the ensuing geometric, archaic, and classical periods, remains little known. Despite the original target of the Canadian Palepaphos Earth, survey project, which was to investigate the spatial patterning of the settlements within an Iron Age kingdom, to this day, we have no comprehensive settlement pattern analysis of the hydrological basin of Paphos in the first millennium BC. And what we have so far achieved with the settlement pattern in the course of the Bronze Age is imperfect. The site hierarchy system of Paphos must become a major research target. And if I may add, also that of the neighboring Kuris River Valley. Bounded by the mountains to the north, the coast to the south, and spreading over four parallel river basins, Paphos could not be more different than the north, the east, and west regions of Cyprus and their peripheries geomorphologically, but also in terms of access to raw resources and external markets. But there are some extremely meaningful indicators in the material culture and the scribal tradition, also in the little known sacred landscape formed by the extra urban sanctuaries, which would suggest that for a considerable length of time, Paphos, probably since the 12th century, was in control of the Kuris catchment. The arena, therefore, for high quality doctoral dissertations is open and ready to receive young scholars in the archaeology of Cyprus. In your next or your first visit to the evocative Kukli Archaeological Museum, which is appropriately housed in the Manor House, locally known as the Chiftlik, bear in mind that you will be viewing material remains from the three different lives of Paphos and the two different lives of the sanctuary. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Well, to begin with, I, will, I would like to say in English how much I thank all my collaborators from 2002, colleagues, students that uh, were once freshmen and are now expert uh, in their field of study. It is all these young people that have uh, nurtured the PALP project. And I thank them all, and I hope that they will continue to work in Palepapos long after I have gone. Τώρα, έχουμε εργαστεί για 20 χρόνια στην περιοχή της Παλεπάφου σε μια προσπάθεια να προσεγγίσουμε την χρονολογική και χωρική ταυτότητα της περιοχής, να την προστατεύσουμε έτσι ώστε να μπορέσει στα χρόνια που έρχεται να δημιουργηθεί ένα πραγματικό αρχαιολογικό πάρκο που να μπορέσει να συνδέσει την πλουσιότατη ιστορία μιας από τις δυναμικότερες αρχαίες πόλεις κράτη του νησιού μας, της Κύπρου, με την περιφέρεια της. Γι' αυτό και δημιουργήσαμε τρία επίπεδα χωρικής έρευνας. Το μικρό επίπεδο με το οποίο εργαζόμαστε στην καταγραφή των ανασκαφών στις συγκεκριμένες θέσεις, στις οποίες αναζητούμε το υλικό με το οποίο καταγράφεται η 
ιστορία της εξέλιξης της πολιτείας της Πάφου, η οποία φαίνεται να συγκεντρώνεται σε τέσσερα ξεχωριστά οροπέδια. Η δεύτερη κλίμακα είναι η κλίμακα με την οποία προσπαθούμε να προσδιορίσουμε και να καταγράψουμε το αστικό περιβάλλον της αρχαίας πολιτείας, όπως αυτό εξελίχθηκε από την πρώτη στιγμή που εγκαταστάθηκαν άνθρωποι στο τέλος της μέσης εποχής του Χαλκού, μέχρι και το τέλος της ύστερης αρχαιότητας. Και η τρίτη κλίμακα είναι η μεγάλη μακροκλίμακα, η οποία μας υποχρεώνει να δουλέψουμε και να ερευνήσουμε ολόκληρη την υδρολογική λεκάνη της Πάφου, διότι εκεί θα συναντήσουμε όλα τα τεκμήρια της πολιτικής οικονομίας, η οποία βοήθησε στην ανάπτυξη αυτής της πολιτείας τόσο στην εποχή του Χαλκού, όσο και στην εποχή του Σιδήρου. Το σίγουρο είναι ότι υπήρξαν απρόσμενες επιτυχίες στην ανακάλυψη μνημείων από την περίοδο της Κυπροκλασσικής Δυναστείας της Πάφου, που και μας μας άφησαν εκπληκτούς. Διότι τα μνημεία αυτά έχουν, περιέχουν υλικό με το οποίο μπορούμε να συνδέσουμε διαφορετικές περιόδους και διαφορετικές εποχές και να δώσουμε πάρα πολύ δυναμικά συμπεράσματα στο θέμα της οικονομίας βάσει της οποίας έζησε και διαχειρίστηκε το περιβάλλον της η αρχαία πάθος. Σας ευχαριστώ.